Welcome to episode 43 of Engaging Franciscan Wisdom. My name is Sister Michelle Lallier, and I'm happy to introduce our guest host, Darlene Prides. Welcome, Darlene. Thanks, Michelle. In this episode of Engaging Franciscan Wisdom, I'm going to continue to break open the subject of Franciscan spirituality as a countercultural path with Jean-Francois godet Calagatis, a professor emeritus at St. Bonaventure University. Welcome, Jean-Francois. Well, thank you for having me. Absolutely. I'm so looking forward to this conversation together. Jean-Francois, you've had and continue to have a fascinating life with a long-standing engagement with the Franciscan tradition, both as a scholar and as a practitioner and activist, too. Um, how would you like to start? Can we start with a bit about your life and how you first encountered Franciscan spirituality? Yes, uh, <clears throat> my Franciscan journey that uh, is far from being finished, uh, started in a way at my birth because uh, my parents were, I was the first uh, firstborn, uh, first of five children, and my parents were a great faithful Christian and with uh, devotion, the St. Francis of Assisi and St. Claire of Assisi were in their spiritual world. And so they named me Jean-Francois. And from childhood, the, the presence of St. Francis, my patron saint, was there with a statue by my bed, uh, uh, the, the the wolf of Gubbio, uh, the beautiful prayer that he never wrote. Um, and then Claire as well, because a sister followed me and she was named Claire. Uh, my childhood was spent with St. Francis and uh, I knew all the stories, all the Fioretti, the little flowers. But uh, the second stage was when I became a young adult. First, as a student, uh, through a course on uh, Italian literature, I discovered that Francis Francesco was only part of his name, that he was baptized Giovanni John. So I came back to my parents and said, I did not know that... Uh, Francis was also John, that Francois was also Shaw. And they looked at me and laughed and said, well, that's why we called him like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and shortly after that, uh, I was then a young teacher in high school. I discovered through a friend, friends are important in my life, certainly. Through a friend, I discovered that besides all those little flowers, Francis had left writings. And uh, since I was teaching Latin, I was delighted to find out that the writings were in Latin, for, with one exception, this canticle. And I started reading that, and uh, <laughs> Francis fell down his pedestal. Francis became then a human being that wanted to be a brother to all and whose reference was Jesus and the gospel. So although I was baptized, I had been an altar boy, I loved to play with incense, etc. cetera, um, that was a turning point. And uh, reading the writings of Francis, that is full of quotes from the gospel. I, I started reading the gospel as I had never read it before and found out that the gospel happened and was written in a historical context. And the same thing with the writings of Francis expressing within an historical context, a way of life. And um, it, it, it very quickly became a passion 
I could not imagine my life outside of that. Mm -hmm. So it's really that lived experience. You were really embracing the lived experience of both yes. Francis and Jesus through these yes. texts. I cannot separate them. Yeah. Can, can I just ask you, is it because of your teaching? You know, you had to relate these texts to the students. Was it through the teaching that you came into no. this relation? No? No, actually, I'd, I never, at that point in high school, I wasn't teaching the writings of Francis or the gospel to my students. But I was just, I think I was at a point, you know, when you, uh, I was starting after all years of studies and here I am a young teacher with a master's degree and, and everything seems to be going very well, but all of a sudden I look around and I start panicking. I said, well, I'm not so sure that this school it was with Christian brother. They was great at the windows. It's a little carceral. I can't imagine that I will spend the rest of my life in that surroundings. And so I was looking for a passion and the passion came with the writings of Francis that took me back and deeper into the gospel, the good news of, of Jesus. Uh, that is how it happened. And of course I became, at that point, I became very happy, much happier than I had been before. I, I always loved the students, but uh, I, I was dissatisfied by the institutional context. And since then and other experience, I'm not a very institutional guy. Uh, <laughs> Um, I've, I guess I'm, I'm more of a, uh, what of an artist or of, of the present. I'm an historian and I love history, but it's to help me understand and live the present, mm -hmm. not, not to be with old stones. <laughs> yeah. I love this. You know, your transformation was really grounded in, uh, discontent, dissatisfaction. Yes. Um, much like Francis, right? Well, I, I realized that afterwards because, um, that didn't come from his writing, but when I started reading all the other documents, the biographies, I realized that, uh, yes, he had had that, uh, experience. Mine was not as traumatic or dramatic, uh, but a time that you really, you thought everything was clear. And all of a sudden, it doesn't make sense. It's not clear. And, and then comes an, an, an inspiration. That's exactly what happened. And, you know, I'm an historian. I'm also a philologist. So the words are, I play with them all the time. Inspiring means that there is a spirit that is brought into you. And, and then, well, you start breathing and acting differently. And that's what happened to me. Mm -hmm. But when that happened and I was at the time, uh, 22, um, I, <laughs> I did not know where all that would take me throughout the decades that followed because now I'm going to turn 76. So, uh, at quite a little bit of, uh, time. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so how has your view or experience, let me say that your experience of your Franciscan identity changed and developed? Well, I said, where, where can I live that life? And it came to me like the, the, the place, uh, the obvious place was to join the Friars Minor and, uh, which I did. And at the time after the Vatican II Council, uh, there were some, uh, experiments of, uh, trying to go back to the sources. And so I, again, through a friend, another one, I discovered a small group, uh, of friars. The, the oldest one must have been 35 and, and another one 33. And then there were three or four of my generation, uh, living in a small group in a small house in a poor neighborhood 
of Brussels in Belgium because uh, I was born in Belgium and grew up in Belgium. So I joined them and very happily, I continued to teach and then uh, had to make a decision. Uh, at the time in Belgium, we still had a draft. So there was a one year military service, but I went to court and I said, I don't want to. I don't want anything to do with the military, with the army, but I want to serve. So I was sentenced instead of one year in the army to two years, uh, in, in a social service in a devastated neighborhood of Brussels, uh, that the people were either old, poor Belgians or immigrants from Morocco, Algeria, Turkey, Greece, and uh, hard worker, uh, the immigrants with a lot of children, and all those people were being expelled so that uh, all the houses could be torn down. And there was a, I'm not kidding, there was a Manhattan project to then build big skyscraper and and big business. And so that was, I would say my Franciscan novitiate mm -hmm. to deal with that situation, help the people. And I had a couple of companions who were uh, like me, conscientious objectors, and we were working with the people, helping them. Uh, and on the side and unofficially, we were also, uh, social justice activists, uh, trying to have some political change. Uh, but, uh, I learned that in those two years, I learned a lot. Uh, I was so happy to be able to uh, get in touch and being invited in the families of, uh, people from Morocco, Greece, uh, Turkey, and eat at their table, uh, discovering other foods than the regular, uh, Belgian food. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so after that, uh, I didn't go back to the high school teaching. I needed something else. And, uh, I had, uh, developed a, a, a Communi communication, friendship with a, a friar minor that uh, is relatively known. I mean, he died in 68 uh, or 78, uh, Théophile Debonnet. Mm -hmm. And Théophile Debonnet uh, said, I think you should go back to Louvain, to your university and get a, a doctorate uh, in medieval studies. They have an Institute of medieval studies that is very good. And, uh, and then you get all the medieval background and on your own, you read everything you can read from Paul Sabatier until today. <laughs> and I did that and I just enjoyed it because, uh, uh, I had a good mentor. Uh, a Benedictine monk who told me that if I wanted to be an historian, I had to read many mysteries and he had read all the Agatha Christie. <laughs> <laughs> so I did, I did. And, uh, uh I had wonderful, uh, uh, teachers, professors, and I got really, uh, a, an overview of the 1000 years of, uh, that we call the middle ages in the political, the religious, the social, the economic, uh, development. And then with all my readings and talking with uh, people like Théophile de Bonnet, I integrated that and I was doing that for myself. And then I found myself becoming a Franciscan scholar that was being called here and there to give, uh, workshop and courses and. So that was the, the second step in my uh, journey, my development. Mm. It was not the last. <laughs> I, I'm sensing there's going to be integration between the practitioner activist side of you and the scholarship side of you. Is that true? That, definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but I will struggle with that. I will struggle with that because meanwhile I had. I had moved to another small group 
and uh, it, this time even more in my in my field, so to speak, because uh, I'm I'm a rural guy. I'm another an, an urban guy, and uh, it was a small group in uh, in a small village, and uh, I immediately started participating in the life of the village and mingling with people, and, and that didn't work too well. Mm. Uh, um, let's say that. The others were in the village more for the quiet, but they, they had no real intention to be part of the village. And I was doing too much. The problem even exploded when an old man in the village who was a beekeeper said, I cannot continue. And I would like you to continue to take my bees, my honey bees. And, uh, I said, yes, and I could teach other people. So, because he had taught me how to do that. And, uh, so that was a bit the beginning of real trouble because now I was involved in some activity, rural activity, and then there were bees around. And then, uh, I, I had, I was, you know, preparing the, the honey and, uh, uh, they thought that I was developing a business that was absolutely not mm -hmm. the case. So. I, I was beginning to be in trouble with, with the, the official order of Friars Minor. Um, I am sensing a theme, a countercultural theme here. <laughs> <laughs> Always yeah. against the institutional framework in which you're living. Well, I'm, I'm not, I'm not doing it on purpose, I but, get it. but I have been more than once labeled rebel. Um, and it's just because I see things that for me, uh, makes sense, but then I get in trouble. Um, during that time, I discovered, uh, the writings of Claire of Assisi, mm. and that is through another friend. I was giving a course on the Testament of Francis to a group of poor Claire's and, uh, uh one, uh, just a little older than I. She said, this is very interesting, but would you do something like that for Claire? So I said, sure. And so that, that expanded my vision of the Franciscan way of life, because I realized that Claire was not a second order. Claire was not a nun in enclosure. Claire was a sister with the brothers and, uh, it was the, basically the same way of life. The man on the road in, in movement, the women in a place that they called monastery. Culturally, it was just as the world was moving. Women were not normally uh, traveling and, and uh, mingling with people, but that doesn't mean that, uh, they were in, locked in, in prison. Mm -hmm. So I realized, nah, th that story of first and second order, like first and second class doesn't really fit. And, uh, it, of course it, it added to my growing trouble <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and at, at, at some point I was, uh, after a chapter, you know, when they, they redo the, the families, well, I was, uh, I was asked to move and, uh, uh, at that point I brought a project and the project was to definitely go to another village and develop something with the people. And I went to see in a changed area so that it wouldn't be in conflict. Uh, I moved to another area of, uh, rural, uh, Wallonian Belgium. And, uh, I went to see the, the head of the church, the dean of, uh, the area and uh, explained what, uh, my situation was and what I was wanted to do. And he put me in contact with, uh, a, a farmer my age, who was actually a social worker, but also a farmer. And we developed a friendship and a cooperative. 
and uh, oh, I was so relieved. Uh, he, he had chicken for the market, um, and then I was in in charge of the milk of the cows uh, to make yogurt and to make cheese. Uh, I actually developed a, a specific cheese that I hear is still being made. And then at some point, something happened that took me away from that. The Franciscan sisters that I had been working a little bit with giving talks and workshops, they came to me and explained to me that there was an international project to uh, write, to draft a new rule for all the congregation of the third or the regular, uh, but based on the writings of Francis and Claire, and they were asked me to lead that group because of my knowledge of those writings and my ability to relate and to converse and to work in with different languages. And uh, that has been quite an experience. Another couple of years uh, of my life where I discovered listening to the members of that international work group uh, in which was actually Margaret Carney uh, that <laughs> was, has been instrumental in me being in the States. Um, I realized again that the third or the regular, there was not a third class and that uh, then it became very clear to me that there was one movement, one spiritual family with Francis and Claire, the brother and the sister, at the root of that, inspired by the gospel of Jesus. And that movement developed in a very inclusive way to the beginning, but then, of course, um, with some complicities and a good intention, it had to be organized. Yeah. It had to be canonically organized. Yeah, institutionalized. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, oh my God, I was feeling more and more like uh, uh, a brother, but without order. And I never knew if, if it was, well, I think it was a compliment from the Minister General of the time, John Vaughan, but a punishment from my province, uh, I was sent to the headquarters in Rome mm -hmm. as a, an assistant to the connection with the poor Clares and the uh, Franciscan of the third or the regular. Well, that was something else. Uh, the good side of that is that I traveled a lot going uh, to places to teach the way of life from the writings of Claire and the now new rule and form of life of the third order regular. Um, that was my happiness. So I was traveling and then I was coming back to Rome and that was depressing. And uh, it was a contract of three years. After three years, I was, I was exhausted. Um, I was physically exhausted. Uh, my sleep was not doing well and my digestion was not going well. Um, and I, I still laugh because I had heard there were friars there that their whole career was, was there in Rome. And, uh, I had heard the, the saying that after three years in Rome, you're a ruin, but after six years, you're a monument. And, uh, so I, I said, I'm too young to be a monument. I'm gonna take that ruin back to Belgium. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I did, mm. but, uh, back to Belgium, um, I had a, a couple of friends that, uh, actually I had helped, uh, they had foster children and they had a little apartment at the North sea. 
and it was uh, end of January, uh, early February, 1986. And there, I had no place to, to go. Uh, Traven said, close the door behind me. So they said, why don't you go and rest? So I went. And so I lived literally like a hermit for four, five months uh, until the summer. And uh, well, the provincial minister of the time was a good man, but I think he did really not know what to do with me. And he came three times offering me something that I, I have labeled my three temptations in the desert. And uh, um, at the end of that, it became clear that uh, I had to leave. And what I did that think feel like? What did that feel like? It felt horrible. Mm. It felt terrible. It felt that after 18 years or so, um, I was, I was losing my, my life. I was, I was, uh, I, I, I wasn't me anymore, the, but I faced that, uh, friends were very, again, very supportive, very instrumental and, uh, some uh, Margaret Carney and others when traveling to Europe would stop and visit me in my little house in the village in uh, Belgium. Uh, during the time that I was uh, five years in my village, uh, one friend told me that her mother had heard that I was not a Franciscan anymore. And she responded to her mother that, no, he's not in the order of Friars Minor anymore, but he is a Franciscan. That has been a moment of grace to me to realize that, yes, my Franciscan soul was not attached to any institution. And I was grateful for what I had received in the institution. And it's a lot that is part of myself, but I realized I am Franciscan and I can explain what it means to me. It's a way of life and I will continue. Well, what was becoming then also important is that what, what about my companionship? And what happened is that, uh, still in touch with, uh, Franciscans in the United States, uh, from the third order regular, because of the work I had been doing with them, I found myself in the States again, to give workshops on evangelical life. And it's in that context that one day in October, 1989. I was in Chicago and I met several Franciscans there. It was the editorial board of the magazine Haversack. And, uh, one of the members of the board, a very instrumental member, actually the one that had been instrumental in starting Haversack was Athena. Athena Calogeras, and uh, when I arrived uh, where uh, people were, um, we started chit-chatting and then uh, Athena told me, I'm going for a walk by the lake, Lake Michigan. Would you like to come along? And I said, oh, sure. And uh, it was amazing. We really felt in tune. Uh, we talked very personal about our Franciscan life, our Franciscan spirit, and even laughing because at some point Athena asked me, well, when you left the order of Friars Minor, what did you lose? And I laughed and I said, my social security, uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. which, which was absolutely true. Yeah. And, and still is, uh, there, there is no 
Well, yes, there is a social security check that comes, but that, well, that's not what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, Athena and I continue to communicate over, you know, I was back in Belgium and sending letters to each other and sometimes a phone call, but that was very expensive at the time. But uh, we, we grew in harmony is the same understanding of what Franciscan life is all about, uh, that it's not a, a close circle. It's actually, and, and it, it goes back to the gospel. It's, it's a yeast in the dough and, uh, the yeast without dough dies and the dough without yeast dies also. And that is the image that I have and we have to say we need to be involved and in its relationship and it's an alternative to what the world has become and continue to be. So it was very life-giving for me to develop that relationship that first considered as a, a, a strong friendship. And, uh, of course I was reading Haversack and, and, uh, all the involvement in uptown Chicago, uh, that, uh, Athena and a, f a few others, uh, were part of, I was trying to develop something similar in my little village. And uh, to the day that Athena said, uh, I have a, a ticket, I have mileage, and I would like to come and visit you in Belgium. And if you had time, I would love to go to Assisi with you. And I was so excited about that. And we did it. And, uh, but we did not know that uh, Assisi would definitely change our life because after visiting San Damiano, we decided to go below San Damiano and have a picnic. And, uh, after the picnic, we decided that we would continue to journey, not from far away, but together as a married couple. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, yeah, sometimes, uh, I think that was in the air of Claire, she may have been at work. Who knows? Uh, what I know just for a joke is that 10 years later, we went back, I had to be in a season. We went back and we went to have a picnic, uh, to at the same place. And when we arrived, there was a big sign, no picnic. <laughs> Oh, but we that, trespassed. We yeah. trespassed. <laughs> yeah, that's um, that's a very institutional statement, isn't it? Right. It is. It is. So we got married and we moved. I moved to Chicago, and uh, uh, was involved with the Franciscan circle and the people. It was a based community in Chicago. Social justice, uh, celebrating the Eucharist in uh, homeless shelter. Um, but then we moved to Cleveland. Uh, Athena wanted to leave Chicago so that, uh, we could start something new together. Mm -hmm. And we went to Cleveland where her mother was uh, still alive. And then we got involved there. We, we found uh, a base community, started working, uh, Athena, uh, got a job in teaching, a, a GED basic, uh, education to teenagers. Uh, I got involved also teaching computer to the staff and the student. And, uh, that lasted, uh, we got involved in, uh, all the fight for universal healthcare uh, that Athena had been part of in, uh, in Chicago. And I became part of it when I realized that when I left Belgium, I also lost my healthcare because everywhere else, everybody has access to healthcare. So since then we have been, and still are involved in that, trying to bring healthcare for all. We went to demonstration. I was 
playing my guitar. Everybody was singing um, because we also consider that uh, it, it has to be cheerful and joyful. So if we cannot sing and dance, it's a sad revolution. So, and then Margaret Carney had become the director of the Franciscan Institute. And uh, she called me to become part of the faculty and take charge of the journal Franciscan studies. And, uh, that's why for now, uh, 19 years, we are in Allegheny and, uh, as I said, involved in the fight for healthcare. Also Athena has started, we are starting tomorrow our seventh summer season of veggie wheels, which is basically uh, raising money to be able to purchase vegetables and fruit from local farmers and bring it to the people in public housing who do not have access to that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, Athena has succeeded in having that program integrated in the county um, health department. And, uh, also for during the pandemic, <laughs> uh, we started developing a village basically for Athena and I, in our mind, it's outside of Assisi, uh, you know, Francis and Claire, well, the upper Assisi and the lower Assisi, I don't want to say the Republican and the Democrats were fighting, there were people that had no access to the resources outside. And so that's what we're trying to do, uh, focusing on the growing, the aging population here and, um, the isolation of many people. And so what we're trying to do is to create relationship community through exchange of services and some events where we can have fun. Um, it, even if it's only having a cup of coffee or go to the brew pub and have a beer, uh, um, things like that, or a picnic, we're going to have one later in July. Yes. Oh, I hope you'll send me some photographs from that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, Jean-Francois, what you have shared with me is just such a, a buoyant life, a, a life of scholarship, yes, and multiple relationships that have inspired you and pushed you forward into not just studying the Franciscan tradition, but living it out in new and, um, and I would say vulnerable ways, not always safe ways. Um, right. Right. When you, when you break from institutions, there is a vulnerability there, isn't there? But it is a passion. And I always yeah. told my students, it is a passion. And the word passion has two meanings. There is the passionate love, but it, you cannot separate from the other side of the coin of the suffering. Yep. And, and, and then I, I give them the, the example. I, I'm a cyclist. I love bicycling and I love our area that is hilly, but sometimes when you get to the end of one of those hills, it hurts, <laughs> but I love it. <laughs> well, you know, just like the word passion, joy, it, joy also has those two sides, right? Yep. There's this yep. happiness part of joy, but there's also the groundedness and suffering. Yes. Yes. I must say, I did not become a scholar against my will. That is not true, but my purpose is still my purpose is to, to study, to understand better and better so that I can live it better. Yeah. And that has been so clear from what you shared, you know, as we wrap up our time together, I'm just wondering if there's anything else you'd like to share before we end. Um, well, what I can share is that through ups and downs and moments of joy and moments of suffering, when I look at the line of my life, 
in terms of level of happiness, I consider that it has consistently be growing. Mm -hmm. That I'm happier today than 10 years ago, than 20 years ago. And uh, I don't see that finishing. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you so much for that, Jean-Francois. And thank you for spending time with me today. Um, I've learned a lot about you, your life, but yeah. I've also learned more about the Franciscan way. So thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. And uh, I'm very happy you gave me the opportunity to tell my story. Yeah, we'll have to do this again. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the podcast today. I'm looking forward to the next interview in this series on Franciscan spirituality as a countercultural path and invite you back to hear Athena Godet Calagueras, who will share about her life as a community organizer. Until then, may you be blessed with peace and all good. <laughs>